Thanks, Sarek. Um, all right. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, hey everyone, uh, welcome to the design thinking process workshop. Um, so just before we get started, um, I would like to note that this is a beginner's workshop. Um, so uh, I'll be breaking things down into more digestible chunks. Um, and that's, uh, yeah. So I'll be talking about things in a lot more specific detail than I usually would. Um, so if you're intermediate, this might be like a bit more like broken down than you're used to. Uh, so uh, as you know by now, my name's Kenneth um, and I am a UX designer from Vancouver. Uh, currently I work at Change Healthcare as a UX researcher and my background is in uh, interactive arts and technology. Uh, and I have a design concentration uh, with a minor in print and digital publishing. And so my passion in, for UX comes from this sort of natural curiosity. Um, I like to learn about people and their experiences and that's kind of what drove me towards this field. Um, and I enjoy both uh, the design and research aspects of uh, UX. Hi everyone, um, I'm Anne, and I will be the workshop assistant today. I'm currently the um, co-founder of My Travel, a group travel planning app for friends. Um, we just launched like a few days ago. Um, I also go to Simon Fraser University um, in Vancouver um, in my fifth year right now with a concentration in design and a minor in business. I have experience with um, user experience design, brand identity and project management. Um, so as you guys know, the workshop today will introduce um, design thinking it as a problem serving model that you could utilize for the actual competition if you choose to attend, of course. And if you're not um, participating in the prototype itself um, and just here for the knowledge, uh, it's still a pretty cool opportunity to learn about a model that is actually utilized in a real world setting by a lot of companies um, with tricks here and there, of course. Um, so pay close attention. Um, yeah, and as you know, the workshop is recorded. So feel free to review it later if you like. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation though, um, you just drop them in the chat and I'll try to get to you. Um, and without further ado, I'm excited to pass to Kenneth to start telling us a bit more about design thinking. So um, it goes by many names, um, but as designers, we call it uh, the design thinking process. And what it is, is a framework that is used behind uh, human centered design. Um, so um, it's a philosophy that puts people at the core of solving complex problems. The goal is to understand uh, what the problem is and how people are affected. Um, and then begin trying out as many solutions as we can in order to tailor a product to a specific user's needs. Um, the desired outcome is to sort of find this balance between um, feasibility, desirability, and viability. Uh, so between uh, the business, um, what is actually sustainable as a business model, um, the technology, what's actually doable, as well as the user, something that people want or need. And so there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of proposed approaches to design thinking, um, but the essence of it comes down into six steps, each with sort of its own um, goal. And that is, oops, first off, uh, empathy. So conducting research on the problem and the people it affects. Um, define to understand that problem and understand what people need. Um, then we can begin to use this to explore intervention opportunities, um, which then leads into prototyping. So building out uh, the solutions to then test and validate um, and document. And last but not least is to implement. So putting your vision and your ideas into effect. So as you can see, it is a nonlinear um, approach and it is also very iterative. Um, 
you'll find yourself constantly discovering new things and having to go back and forth between the entire process. Um, and like I said, this is how we build a foundation of understanding people. And from this, we then use it to sort of generate a bunch of ideas uh, to begin building them out and sharing with the people we designed this for um, in order to put it out into the world. Um, so for the focus of this workshop, um, we'll be talking more about empathizing, defining and ideating. So what it means to fully understand um, sort of the people and the problem and how do we begin exploring um, ways to solve it. The other workshops later in the day and tomorrow will be talking about prototyping and testing as well as management, I think. So um, to make it easier for you guys to digest and understand um, this model, let's actually work uh, together on a topic, just like how you will be given a, a team for the competition or just any problems that you have to solve really. Um, so for this workshop, let's all think about um, online learning during COVID, which is something that um, all of us have had experience with um, the last few months. Uh, of course, if you're a student, um, if not, sorry. Um, and yeah, off to the first step. So um, the process always begins with sort of understanding the problem as well as the people it affects um, and how it affects them. So keep in mind, we want to consult with subject matter experts. Um, and this is so that we can see firsthand what the major areas of concern are, sort of what's been implemented um, and what's had the most or least amount of impact. Um, the research and the findings that we get here don't have to be complicated or complex at all. They have just, they're just very simple ways of uh, collecting information, uh, such as looking at primary or secondary sources, um, collecting mass data or even one-on-one -on -one interviews. <clears throat> the, the goal is to get real and tangible evidence so that we can move forward with and begin defining what the problem is. Um, so with uh, online learning, uh, the experts you're consulting with could be educators, professors, instructors, teachers, or really um, researchers who are concerned with education. Um, in this case, you can also um, consult with students, so your peers, or for example, um, because they are directly affected by this. You can talk to them, survey them. Um, so let's say, you know, conducting primary, primary research, or you can read the articles they wrote, um, the studies they ran uh, by, you know, by those uh, researchers. So that is called secondary research. Um, so sort of the how do we begin? Um, where is a good place to start is something that you might be wondering. Uh, and so something that I personally like to do is start by listing things into these uh, four quadrant. So what you know, you know, are things that you can guarantee are not bias. What you know, you don't know are things that you need to go and learn more about. Things that um, you don't know, you don't know are things that you want to sort of dig deeper into. Um, and what you don't know, you know, are things that you need to validate. So are they biased um, or is this actually true? Um, the goal of this is to set aside the personal assumptions that you might have um, and make yourself aware about how broad the topic actually is and how little you know. Um, again, we're trying to start from nothing and build our foundation in order to move forward. Um, additionally, this is also kind of a useful way to sort of plan out how you're going to start the research and who you're going to conduct research with. So um, I can tell you a little bit more about how we're going to apply this model for, um, you know, our topic. So, for example, under things that are not biased, um, I can say for sure COVID 100% will change education for now and near future. I know schools are shut down, um, replaced with loss of e-learning, for sure. I know online learning will affect um, instructors and students to an extent, but um, you know, other things that I need to learn. Okay, COVID will change things, but I am not sure of the extent that effects um, that it would have on learning or education or teachers and students. Will online learning be effective? Um, uh, under what scenarios would it be more effective than in-person learning? Is it here to stay for a long time? 
um, et cetera, all those things require research. And then um, for things that um, I don't know, I know. Uh, so let's say I assume that students will be less motivated um, in an online learning environment, because it can be that case for myself uh, or a few other people that I talk to, but this does not make it true. I still need to do more research to confirm the idea. And finally, what you don't know, you don't know. Uh, it is very hard to say, but uh, my advice is to just really dig really deep. And um, you know, you'll keep fighting about finding out about more information later on. Okay. So one other thing that I want to dig deeper with is um, doing interviews. Um, so these are this is one of the most basic um, techniques that we use, but it also provides uh, the most insights. Um, if you can do them correctly. So uh, like Anne was saying, we do primary and secondary research to learn about what's happening. But we use interviews to understand what people are doing, saying, thinking, and feeling. And so this is to gain insight directly on how uh, what the problems people are facing and how it affects them. Um, and so more often than not, what your participants say will not give you a very detailed or in-depth answer. Uh, your job is to dig deeper and keep asking why and never take their answer at face value because they might not be aware that they know more. And we always have to be ethical. So if you need to learn about rules of ethics, um, you can search up something called the Tri-Council Tri Policy Statement, the TCPS, and their ethical conduct for research involving humans. Uh, but essentially, you always want to respect the participants uh, respect their time and make them feel comfortable. And they should be made aware. Um, they can leave whenever they want to. So um, now that we have sort of this very convoluted um, research data, uh, that's sort of only been categorized by the people that we've collected them from, uh, we need to begin analyzing and synthesizing this information that we found. Um, and there's a number of ways to do this. Um, we like to use uh, very visual and narrative ways to understand the core problem. And this is so we can define it in a human-centered way. So problem statements. Um, problem statements are essentially descriptions that, uh, that address what the problem is and its surrounding issues. Um, and since we're doing human-centered design, we need to phrase them in a way that emphasizes people. So what are their goals? What are their needs? So some of the examples I have listed here um, are diary studies. So this is done with over time um, to reflect on behavior, personas to narrate different categories and archetypes of characters. Uh, empathy maps to understand what people are doing, saying, thinking, and feeling. Synthesis walls uh, is a collaborative way to debrief the research that you and your team did. Uh, user stories allow you to document what features you need to develop um, based on the current user interaction. And journey maps to describe how your user interacts with touch points um, along with how their perception changes. Um, for those of you who don't know what touch points are, um, they're essentially um, any point of interaction, whether it's socially, digitally. Um, yeah. So they just map out sort of like the main category of flow that uh, people take in order to complete a task. So uh, in more details, affinity diagrams or synthesis walls um, we write down all the notes from our research into single items and organize them uh, into sort of relevant themes, either on a wall digitally or physically. Um, this allows us to sort of see the bigger picture of what the problem is, but also focus in on very specific issues. Um, so something like how people are behaving or what the environment's like. Um, if you're competing in this hackathon, um, Something that might be useful for you is Fig Jam, and it's a very it's a collaborative tool for you to sort of um, build sort of flows and uh, 
maps like this. Hey, um, so maybe your synthesis walls under this topic will look like this. Um, actually, it uh, for the actual competition, uh, you should have many more notes than this, uh, but this is just an, an example that I quickly put together. Um, so this is something that you're trying to work on with your team. So is it actually a very good way to ally um, everyone's vision on the matter? Um, for example, here, um, the main goal is to kind of group these cards together into categories um, because they relate it. Um, usually people have at least three cate categor categories here. I can't speak English, um, but of course you can have more and you should have more. Okay. Uh, so next up we have personas. And so what personas are are fictional characters that you've created um, to sort of represent a type of character. Um, so the act is guides for you, um, for you and your team when it comes to making design decisions. Um, and if you ever get stuck, you can always go back to refer um, on what it is they're looking for or what it is that that's getting in their way of completing a task. Um, ideally, you want to aim for around three, um, three personas. Um, and those three act as your primary, your secondary, and your tertiary um, target audiences. And um, there's a lot of information that you can choose, pick and choose from to include in your, um, in your personas. But sort of the things that you always do want to include are sort of the background information, their bio. Um, do they have any limitations or abilities that you need to highlight? What are their needs and goals and the pain points that sort of surrounds that um, and their technology adoption life cycle is especially important if you're making a digital solution um, because it tells you at what point in the uh, at what point will they begin um, interacting with the the solution that you're offering Okay, um, so this is for people who will be attending the competition. Please include your personas in your submission. Um, so yeah, first thing, just to add to what Kenneth already said, um, persona is so a great tool to help allow your team's vision and it's just overall very important. Um, actually, it is definitely what we'll be looking for in your submission because it shows that you actually make uh, an effort to understand your stakeholders. There are many ways to create a personas. There are templates out there that you can just quickly grab and use. Um, while the templates act as great guidance, think carefully about just ripping those off. Um, the main point is to just uh, make the persona seem real and understandable. So each problem and topic will ask for different um, characteristics that are relevant. So it is up to you to decide on what to include in your persona. So um, we have an example over here. Um, this is a persona of, um, you know, a girl here, um, Emily, a student who is struggling with uh, taking classes online. So you might have surveyed or interviewed a bunch of students to come up with this. Um, important insights could include, but are not limited to goals, um, frustration, pain points, motivation, application that um, they use if applicable, etc. You tend to give this person a name, fix scenario quote to make uh, them seem relatable. Um, so yeah, the goal here is just to create a persona that you can refer to within your team. So let's say, oh, I'm designing it for Emily. Oh, Emily will think this, Emily would think that, um, you know, like an actual person. So next we have journey maps. So journey maps are a representation of the step-by-step -step process or the workflow of how a user interacts given a scenario. Um, so they're mapped to a persona's perspective um, about, and it describes what happens at each interaction or each touch point, um, what obstacles are encountered and the emotional status or change of the user at each touch point. Um, so with journey maps, we can see sort of the obstacles they encounter and begin considering sort of the intervention opportunities and how, um, how they might react to it. 
Um, so again, touch points, for those of you who don't know, are major interactions, either physically, digitally, or socially. Um, so who they're interacting with, how they're interacting with, and sort of, yeah. So in a journey map, we always want to include the persona and the scenario. Um, because this then provides us with the sort of the workflow that they take to, uh, to break down into sort of seeable chunks, so large pictures. Um, and we use this to sort of build the interaction that they do or they use um, either with the service or with other people. Um, and here is when we can start um, listing out what it is that they're saying, doing, thinking, and feeling as well as what are their challenges and the emotional state of um, sort of this entire process. So this is an example of what a journey map could look like. Um, of course you can include, you know, like other stuff, but these are like the basic things that you need to include. Um, so this is a journey map for Emily, the persona that we just showed you. You can kind of see the up and down of her emotions, um, her thought process, um, you know, what she does um, and her goals, her expectation. Uh, so we can kind of see, um, oh yeah, like after she started out um, kind of, you know, curious, oh, she thinks, uh, you know, remote learning, don't have to waste time going, you know, chance commuting and stuff. Um, and then we see her, she's really having the mental breakdown when her internet basically dropped while she was writing her exam on Canvas. So all those things, also touch points that are important and related, um, uh, yeah, will be captured on this journey map basically. And um, it is also a very important thing that we will be looking for in your submission along with your persona. Um, so yeah, just pay, pay close attention. <laughs> yeah. uh, so now that we've sort of gathered a bunch of uh, synthesized research and created um, the problem statement. Um, we want to come up with ideas that can potentially solve the problem. Um, but we have to remember not to get too attached to certain ideas. We just want to come up with as many as we can um, in order to sort of try out. Um, essentially, it's brainstorming. So we want to tackle the problem and sort of come up with the creative ways to uh, align sort of our ideas with the research that we did. Um, so this is done in several methods, but some of the most popular ways is using something called how, I, how might we statements. Um, this is so that you can brainstorm potential ways of solving the problems, um, but sort of just explaining it through concept alone. And following that is solution concepts. So being able to sketch the core concept or explain what it does in one or two sentences. The goal is to be very broad still um, because once you get into something that is too specific, then you've just essentially skipped a step. Okay, um, activity time. So far we have done all the work for you. We gave you a persona, a journey map. So, you know, um, get to do the work and actually do it, please, to see how difficult it is. Um, for those who want to do it physically, so you can just go grab a piece of paper, um, a pen or a pencil. Um, and then, um, yeah, we'll now do the crazy eights activity, which is way more fun when you do with your team, I promise. Um, but we don't, we cannot do that right now. So we'll, you will sketch um, basically eight ideas, solutions um, in eight minutes. So each solution will take up one minute. Um, ideally, just, so just draw eight boxes or fold your paper into eight boxes, whatever it works for you. Or in case you want to um, do it digitally, um, I can drop a PDF file here shortly. Or if you want to, um, to do it on Figma and have a Figma account, um, you can get access to our board over here. Um, so I'm just gonna drop it in the chat. To, and we'll give you the prompt to work on it later. Um, so right now, just like giving give people uh, a little bit time to um, grab their stuff. Uh, just looking for my PDF.
And if you're good to go, maybe just, um, I don't know, send like a thumbs up emoji or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Sorry, is everyone good to go now or? Yeah. I can only see one person on the board, so. I see so many people on the board. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, I think we can just start. Um, okay. Yeah, we're going to give you the um, prompt right now. Uh, so, yeah, everyone just look at uh, the screen sharing for one second. <laughs> Yeah, I can, you can move on. Yeah. yeah, so it's gonna be how my we keep students motivated during remote learning. So um, uh, remember uh, your sketches don't have to be very, like very good or very detailed. Uh, the goal is just to explore ideas. So it's fine if it's messy. I'm not a good sketcher either. Okay, and um, I'll and, start, come on. Anything else to add? No, that's that's good. Okay, so eight minutes. Go. I'm gonna do it too. <laughs>
how much time is left? Um, we have a minute and uh, 30 seconds. Quick, guys. Last, last ideas. Make it the most creative one. Okay. Is that time? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's time. Okay. So how was that for everyone? It was kind of hard once you get to the third and fourth sketch, right? I can't actually hear responses or see the chat. So I'm just going to assume yes. Um, yeah. But essentially, uh, during I the ideation phase, um, it's okay to go for impractical or very weird solutions that might not be feasible. Um, the idea is to gain inspiration because these are the sort of bad ideas that will inspire the good ones. That's sort of like the goal and sort of the way that we do things. And so now that we've done um, ideating uh, a bunch of task, tasks, um, it's now time to choose um, a select few ideas that you think um, fit in with sort of aspects of your users' lives or aligns better sort of with their day-to-day. -day. Um, this is a very experimental phase and the goal is to sort of identify um, the best possible solutions that are worth exploring further um, and building out slowly into something more realistic. Um, you don't want to just start off with uh, fully designed websites or fully coded apps. Um, you want something that's very simple and quick to test to, just so that you can see how people, um, the users that you researched with um, are, re are, are reacting and how, um, how, do, how does your solution fit in to sort of their workflow or their day-to-day. Um, so the goal is to fail early and learn quickly. So this is a very iterative process. Um, and we always want to start off with the essence of the idea and build up its fidelity level. So what that means is going from something very rough into something very, um, very detailed and high level. So we always start off with user flows before we move into screens. Um, so we sort of document the, the steps or the path that people take in order to complete one specific and main goal. Um, next, we create sort of the wireframe. So the structure um, that, uh, that sort of the structure of visual elements that people will see. And this is still very low level. So it's just sort of what is on screen and what is important for people to see. Next, we create mockups. So wireframes, but with design elements added into it. Um, keep in mind, this is still a skeletal framework of the design, so it is still easily changeable. Um, it just has a bit more detail, such as colors, uh, fonts, and um, 
visual elements. Lastly, we want to make prototypes. So adding interactions to the R mockups to show how that flow, that one main flow works. Um, so it should be completable from start to finish. Um, so um, the examples are on the bottom. So workflows are essentially um, what do people see and what will they be doing in order to complete that task. Wireframes, again, you have that very skeletal framework with no design elements included. Um, it's just very basic. Um, no images, no nothing, no colors. Until you reach the mock-up stage where then you begin adding the design elements that you, you created a brand guide for. Um, and then in making sure that it aligns correctly with sort of the vision of the brand. And lastly, interactions. Um, so what will happen if I were to press the, the, the credit card? Um, what would happen if I were to sort of swipe left and right and all that sort of stuff? Um, and this is so that we can make um, iterative testing. Um, so what that means is we return to our users to sort of see are they reacting the way that we expected to, we expected them to. Um, and so we do that in sort of qualitative tests to sort of one, understand their expectations and evaluate the user experience that, um, that the product gives. Or we can do quantitative tests to analyze these trends in user behaviors, um, such, as, uh, um, such as how much, such as like error rate. So can they do it and how long does it take them to? Um, and obtain any numerical data. So the goal is to rigorously test the product in all its stages. So from frames to uh, proto uh, mockups to prototypes, um, we want to sort of see how people are reacting to it and make changes as needed, um, no matter what stage they're at. And so when we do user testing, um, you always want to have as much control of the scenario as possible. Um, so this is why we make a script because it allows us to structure um, sort of what we want to do and uh, tell our users um, what it is they'll be doing, um, plan out exactly the tasks that they'll be doing. Um, and yeah, so it just provides you an opportunity to update uh, your participants with what's going to be happening during the test session. Um, it is important to note to them that if you don't have everything working um, because they might think that it's on them they did something wrong but that's not the case um, explain to them that there's stuff incomplete but you still want to verify specific features and see how they're reacting to it um, before uh, moving on to the next stage of designing this method of conversing back and forth between moderator um, and the and the participant is known as a moderated uh, moderated test session. Um, when we conduct these sessions, we always want to let um, we always want to let them know the scenario and what's happening. Um, so what it is they're looking at, what it is that they're testing, um, as well as that this is not looking into their skills, but rather the feature that you design and how intuitive it is. Um, how you will be conducting the test session, so the methods that you'll be using, which will be covered in sort of the usability test session um, workshop, as well as following the ethical rules. So you always wanna make sure that um, you're respectful and ethical towards them. And that includes filling them in on um, what they can do, which is leaving whenever they want. And lastly, um, after many, many iterations of, of this um, going back and forth between the steps. Um, you should begin putting your uh, visions and your solutions into effect. Um, so what this means is that you've gone through very extensive testing and you understand the impact on people. Um, it is also sort of the step that people tend to leave out the most, um, but it's also arguably the most important step uh, because this is where change and innovation starts. 
um, once you find this sweet spot of um, desirability, viability, and feasibility, you sort of understand what it is that your product does um, and how it affects people and how your business is, is, is impacting change. So just to know that this process isn't a, a recipe for things that will always work. Um, design thinking isn't a set of rules that you follow or um, it's more of a mindset that allows you the creative freedom to sort of explore the problem um, and sort of come up with a solution on your own terms or your team's own terms. Um, it demands time and failure to learn because you need to be able to see both the big picture as well as the small details. Um, so if you don't have the time or if you aren't willing to commit, then just don't use it because it, it's just gonna waste your time and it does have no impact on the solution that you come out with. Um, again, it is a very iterative and nonlinear process. Um, you will be going back and forth between steps as you uncover new things about people, their expectations and um, sort of the problem. It is very common for behaviors and environments to change. And as designers, we must learn how to adapt. Um, I probably repeated this a hundred times by now, but I really want to get to the point that you need to be always doing stuff in order to learn. You need to be going back and forth between prototyping, uh, defining, ideating, or even sometimes all the way back to the start and re-empathize re with the users. Um, yeah. So again, you're working with very complex problems that ne don't necessarily have a clear solution in frame. Um, getting stuck and not knowing how to continue is part of the process that um, as designers we're familiar with. Um, the best thing that you can do um, is to actually ask for help um, or ask for feedback because they are very critical parts of design. Take the, take the things that people say seriously, but don't take them personally, even if they're non-designers. Um, as people in charge of the project, you have the power to choose what to implement and what not to. Um, therefore, you need to take into consideration um, sort of um, what people are saying and be objective because you're not designing for yourself, you're designing for other people, right? And sort of the things that we all talked about, I talked about today and Anne um, are, you can find them here um, on the very right. So if you need to learn about the ethical rules, um, go to ethics.gc.ca. Um, and then there you can find sort of the Tri-City uh, Tri ethical rules and conducts um, or servicedesign.org. And that will provide you with a list of sort of tools and how they work and how you use them um, in all stages of the design process. Okay, so just some note for the uh, comparators. Um, how could you util utilize this problem solving model in the Proton itself? So make sure to follow through with all the steps in the design thinking process here if you're not sure how to approach this photon. Um, our workshops are actually designed in a way that will teach you more in depth about each step. So for this one here um, today, you specifically learn the overall process, uh, the empathy, define and ID steps. Uh, meanwhile, we have other workshops that also focus on prototyping, um, you know, so the Figma series, or the user testing workshop. Um, and then we have the project man management workshop as well, which will be very useful for the uh, Proton itself. The judging criteria is closely related to what you were taught today and the other workshop as well. So uh, also pay extra attention to that. Um, and our uh, final thing is to play to your strength um, and be open-minded to learn. So I know some of you might come from different backgrounds or let's say, you know, business or come to science or, um, you know, engineering. Uh, not all of you came for, from a design background, but design thinking is a model 
um, that uh, could be embraced by pretty much anyone who is a problem solver. Um, because with cautions, like Kenneth already mentioned. Um, and yeah, I think we, we done, <laughs> right? Yeah. So thanks for sitting through the hour with us. Um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to unmute right now and sort of just go ahead and ask them. Um, or you can sort of reach out to us. Our socials are at the bottom right. And I can hand out a copy of this slide deck um, if you guys want. So yeah, uh, if you guys have any questions, feel. I, don't, I think like we have everybody muted, but if you have any questions, you can probably raise your hand and Nick will probably unmute you or you can just type it in chat. We have about five more minutes before we move on to our next workshop. So let's ask our questions quick. We got only five minutes with Anna and Kenneth. You can always ask uh, um, extra questions on uh, the Discord channel, um, especially, you know, those are like anything um, we are happy to discuss with you, but like anything related to the competition itself. Um, yeah, feel free to just ping us on Discord. Um, but yeah. <laughs> and that was great. And it, and yeah, it was a great presentation, really liked it. Definitely very, very informative for a lot of new designers. Like I wish somebody gave me this presentation when I was starting off, because it did go to a depth that I people don't usually go in the, when they're doing like a first presentation into design thinking. Here, I'm gonna jump right in. We've got one question from okay. Sandeep. Uh, what did you mean by social touch points besides physical and digital? Uh, so social touch points are who you're in, who the people are interacting with. Um, so in the case of um, in the case of uh, online learning, your social interactions might is obviously um, with your instructors and your TAs, right? But they're also the people that are around your environment. So like your parents, your roommates, um, do they interrupt you, um, and why? Sort of what are they interrupting you for? Those are the social touch points that I was talking about. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. And then one other thing uh, would advertising count as social touch points? Uh, yes, but also no. Uh, it depends how um, how the advertising is done. Um, so if they if they if say they're walking around the mall and somebody comes up to them, that is that is a social touch point. But if they're watching something um, and then they get interrupted with an ad, then no, that is not a social touch point. That's a digital touch point. I had one last question before we wrap it up. Uh, yeah. Back to what Eric mentioned. What were some of the things you wish you knew before you started? Um, for me or? I guess for, or any of us in general, specifically you. <laughs> specifically me. Um, I think one of the things that I, want, uh, I, I wanted, to, I felt like would have been helpful in my journey is um, sort of just getting started. Um, because a lot of people in a lot of designers want things to be perfect when in reality it's fine that if it's if it's broken or not, not working the goal is just to get started and get doing so that you have that practice um, and once I started just doing um, I was able to sort of like expand my network and sort of um, I gained the confidence to like just um, apply so I applied to my internship and from there, I got my, I, I'm now working full time, right? So you just need to do, like, I was, I was afraid that my portfolio wasn't up to standard. So then I, one day I just said, you know what, I'm just going to apply anyways, because what's the harm is that they say no, but the gain is that I, I start my career path and that's what happened. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys, and we're going to cut it off there. I'm going to pause the recording.